The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has declared Chukoma Soludo winner of the Anambra State Governorship elections after a supplementary election was conducted yesterday. The rubble at the Koyi building collapse has almost been completely evacuated. The families of the victims who were no more seen hanging around the venue are still hoping for miracles as rescuers continue the search. And of course this morning we will be reviewing the major stories making headlines across the papers this morning with Tunde Kolawali. It's a beautiful Wednesday morning and we're glad to have you join us at the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Uh, it feels really great to be back again. I hope you had a wonderful Yes, I did. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. It's uh, Plus TV Africa here on the breakfast and uh, we hope that you, uh, of course, enjoy the next two hours with us of, uh, you know, very interesting conversations. As always, we're going to be going back to Anambra State this morning to, of course, have a quick review and uh, discussion concerning the elections. Chukuma Soludo has officially been declared winner by the Independent National Electoral Commission. And of course, uh, from Anambra, we're back here in Lagos, where we will be looking at the uh, search and rescue efforts at the Koi building collapse. This is some of the conversations that we have this morning, amongst other things. Good morning and welcome. As always, we start with uh, some of the top trending stories, uh, the big stories that have made conversations across Nigeria in the last 24 hours. The first one, of course, is uh, in the National Assembly, where the Senate has gone ahead to approve uh, electronic uh, transmission of results. Um, in a declaration yesterday, they said that they've given uh, INEC, the electoral body, to go ahead to determine how election results will be transmitted, either manually or electronically. If you remember, this uh, has created a lot of controversy and conversations in the last couple of months, actually, across the country, um, with um, you know the NCC initially being brought into the conversation, uh, where the National Assembly had said that the NCC should give approval somehow, some way, and uh, you know clarify. Um, with regards, uh, you know, network coverage on every area across the country where there should be elections. Um, Nigerians, of course, completely were against that and said that, no, it, it has to be the Independent National Electoral Commission. That is what the Constitution says and that is what the electoral law says. And that's, um, it should be INEC determining how to transmit results electronically. Um, and so yesterday they went ahead to give a, a go ahead with that. Um, I, think it's, I think it's good news. I, I think it's, um, it's something that... Um, the Nigerian electorate should be happy about um, with regards, you know, taking further steps and building uh, our electoral process and ensuring that we have a, you know, seemingly smoother electoral process in 2023. That, that's, you know, for me what it seems like. Um, and I think, you know, everyone should, of course, hear the story and say, okay, yes, um, you know, the Nigerian people have won with regards, um, you know, this conversation. So, so one of the things that I've been trying to understand with uh, electronic transmission of a result is, is that going to be an electronic voting? Uh, well, I think, I think it's, 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 still, it's still a part of that conversation. They may not be able to achieve electronic voting yet, um, but it's also left to INEC to determine if they can get that um, um, organized before 2023. I don't think they can because if you look at what happened in Anambra, Anambra basically is almost like a litmus test and they've continued to say different states are litmus tests. Edo State was a litmus test, Oshu State was a litmus test and now Anambra, one, one more state again, a litmus test with regards to 2023. Um, and seeing how BIVAS, which was just introduced, had so many issues. Elections were meant to be held on Saturday. We eventually carried elections all through the weekend all till Tuesday. And they still could not even call out the results or declare a winner early on Tuesday. They waited till late at night. You know, I think it was, it was maybe past midnight, around midnight, before they finally declared Chukuma Soludo winner of the elections. And so all those hitches and all those, you know, you know many, many um, speed bumps here and there, potholes, if you will call them, um, you know, show that they, they still have a lot of work that they need to do with regards to the process. Yeah, and I don't think they, they will be able to achieve electronic voting. So for me, I just think we're jumping the gun. Uh, that's my opinion because I have been thinking and that's why I needed to understand if we're going to have 
um, you know, electronic voting because it would really make sense if there's electronic voting and electronic transmission of results. So uh, how do we now explain? Now the argument and those who are proposing this, as much as yes, it's really okay to introduce this, this is going to help, you know, deepen our uh, democracy. It's going to help and it's going to help strengthen the electoral process. But the point now here is um, we cannot, we cannot categorically say that, uh, you know, fraud would actually be eliminated entirely. All right. So um, having that, um, having electronic results, I mean, having results transmitted electronically is not a guarantee that, you know, fraud would be eliminated entirely from the system. Because you would still have to vote manually and then have to transmit the result electronically. So I'm still trying to wrap my head around yeah, it. So, so I, and I, and I, I think what it, what it you know, helps with is, you know, we're coming from a place where there used to be incidents of ballot box uh, snatching um, and some of all of that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it, it basically helps you know, people uh, to understand that once they vote, the votes from their polling units and all of that can be transmitted electronically. You don't need to wait for an electoral officer, you know, to take results, you know, written on a sheet of paper um, uh, to, you know, INEC office, you know, and so and so it, it makes the process easier. No, no, I totally understand the fact that it will make the process easier. My point is for those who are saying it would actually eliminate, um, you know, uh, fraud. fraud, it would not entirely eliminate it does fraud. help it, do, it may yeah, not entirely, it, it would just obviously. strengthen the entire process but it will not eliminate because like i mentioned earlier on if we have to cast our votes manually and then transmit the result electronically uh, within that particular process a lot's going to happen that's also not going to stop the issue of vote buying as well i mean other issues also so but we just know that hey we're heading somewhere it would hasten the process for mm -hmm. instance you know see collation of result it would actually save time save cost yes. i mean because all of the spending of monies and all of the time we will probably have to announce the result but also there are several factors we also need to consider which is a major issue service providers the issue of network is also you know on top of the list I also have a problem that since we introduced you know the smart card readers in 2015 we haven't really you know sit back to even ensure that we don't have the same mistakes especially with the introduction of the beavers now we're hoping that maybe in 2023 we're going to have the beavers introduced and what are we doing did we have a test run and all of that now in this election one would have actually expected that we probably would have had you know the Anambra election which is the closest election probably have a test run of transmission electronically um, I mean electronic transmission of results result. so but but that didn't happen so at what point are we definitely then going to you know so test I think, run I think that they already process did, to find out what's going to happen they already did uh, you know some of that in in the Edo state elections um, you know, and, and that's why, you know, there's a little bit of difference between the Edo State elections and Anambra elections. It's just disappointing, you know, that Anambra turned out this way because I felt like Edo and Oshu were, you know, pretty smooth. You know, they, they, there weren't a lot of issues with the Edo and Oshu elections. Um, and I thought that Anambra would be, you know, even better than those two. But, you know, seeing the way that Anambra turned out, it's a little dis disappointing. Um, but I will still give kudos to INEC, not because they've done, you know, anything exceptional, you know, mind-blowing or first time we've seen this in the world, but simply because, you know, it's, it's still a work in progress, you know, and that's, that's where I want, to, I want to, you know, stay, that it's still a work in progress. The electoral process, you know, and fine-tuning it here and there is still a work in progress. We are way behind, you know, compared to other countries in the world. But, you know, seeing the way that things move in Nigeria, it's still a work in progress. Eventually, we will, you know, get to a place where we can now vote electronically, hopefully. Um, but, you know, until we get there, you know, let's continue to tweak here and there and fine-tune here and there. It just shouldn't take this much time. I, and that's the challenge I, I, that I'm I thinking that we shouldn't be jumping. You, it's like you have a child. You can't just start having your teeth or start talking. You have to start. So at some point, there's a process. I, I, I so I'm thinking mentioned... that we're just jumping. We're just yeah. jumping from I you know, stage that. one to about stage three or stage four. Right. So I don't, so I don't necessarily I, agree because I get the point that you've made with regards it wouldn't stop vote buying, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but and those, all the practices. Yeah, not, yes. You know, I, I get that. You know, but if you also notice that in Anambra, yes, you know, the allegations of vote buying, but there's also, you know, videos that, you know, showed people rejecting money, you know, being given to them by voters. Sadly, and this is, you know, also, you know, one part, you know, that should be mentioned, and I think it was in a report by one of the electoral bodies, um, a situation room, I believe, you know, that mentioned that the vote buying, you know, that we, see, we saw in Anambra elections was only in the presence of security agents. Policemen and, and the likes were there when people were buying and selling votes, which should be illegal. And so 
it's not just INEC. There's so much, you know, that still needs to be, so, so, so much that still needs to be done with regards to the process. Um, we also mentioned, you know, in, in the course of our discussions that, you know, um, um, polling units weren't open on time. Electoral officers didn't get to the polling units on time. There are places where there were also issues with transporting, that's, that's, uh, uh, you know, that's uh, not uh, election, um, you know, um, materials, um, materials and all of that, which is embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, and those are things that, you know, we should have dealt with as early as 1999 and you moved away from. But we still are dealing with them in 2021. So there's still a lot. And I agree with you that there's still so much that needs to be done. And it feels like we're jumping the gun. But um, as we move forward, you know, as we get closer to 2023, I hope, you know, that the electoral body understands that these lapses cannot be permitted again. We cannot keep discussing these very, very flimsy things in 2023. And they do better. So, mm. so I, I'm just trying to remember, um, there's this particular parable that says if you want to eat like a dog or I don't, I can't, maybe a dog or a goat or something, you have to eat it very well. My point here is, if we want to, I don't remember which of the animals, but my point here is this, if we want to I think it says if you want to swallow a frog, make sure you swallow the Exactly, one. so yeah. that's the point. I mean, I, and I was like talking about eating a dog or a lion. No, my point now is this, if we want to introduce technology, you know, in our elections to help um, strengthen the entire process, of uh, our elections, it's important that we do it from start to finish. I don't think well, we should just wake up and say, okay, at this point, during the registration or uh, I mean, accreditation, so we introduce, you know, a there's, component there's of it. Online, we there's online component. registration. Mm. I'm just saying there's a component. You know, let's just be ready and say we want to have the elections entirely an electronic election. So from start to finish, from the uh, registration process, you know, to the voting, to accreditation, to the casting of vote and coalition and everything. Like I'm a, thinking that, you know, uh, we, we should we, just, we that's move, what I'm thinking, that's my thought. Else, you know, well, but of course, we're your nascent democracy, once so again, we're getting there. It's a work in progress. Of course. Even the online registration still has its challenges. Mm. Even, you know, the collection of PVC, there's still a lot of those challenges, you know, even as much as they've tried to make online registration possible. So it's a work in progress. You know, they will still continue to tweak here and there. I would say I wish that they would be faster with the tweaking process um, instead of taking four years to make a new law. You know, it, it shouldn't take that long. You know, every, 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 we have four years before the next election. You should be able to do whatever checks and balances, you know, dot whatever I's, cross whatever T's in four years. It's enough time. Absolutely. Um, and so it's a work in progress. Let's, you know, give them a, a little round of applause for this one. Um, <laughs> the National Assembly and INEC. You know, and we'll see, we'll see what changes between now and 2023. Also from the National Assembly, there is a bill against unsolicited messages from loan sharks. This one's very interesting. I think it was sponsored by uh, Akin Alabi in the House of Reps. Um, he basically uh, you know, took you know, complaints of many Nigerians. I've received a couple of those phone calls. Uh, your, your friend, uh, Oyetunde, some random name that I've never heard of in my life. Um, they say your friend, Oyetunde Babalola Lawal, uh, is owing, <laughs> took a loan for some, from some loan shark. <laughs> and, you know, they want... The number, the number is probably still on my phone. It's an 01 something something number. You know, and then there's the ones that they send you text messages, you know, telling you that you should tell some name that you have no idea who this person who this person actually exists. That, you know, he should come and pay back his loan that he took, you know, some time ago. And sometimes I look at the number and I'm like, I don't even have this number on my phone. Who is this person? You know, um, Akin Alabi is saying that, you know, they, these are tactics. I that, doff my heart for him. That loan sharks, you know, are using, they're using shaming tactics mm. in order to, you know, get their monies back from Nigerians who have taken loans from them. Um, um, like I said, I've experienced it, you know, and I, I understand, you know, and he also mentioned that in, during the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, and, you know, the financial crisis that went across the world and here in Nigeria, a lot of Nigerians had to seek loans here and there because they needed to survive. And so, you know, in order to get their monies back from these persons who took loans, the loan sharks, you know, have started using every tactic whatsoever, including naming and shaming some of, some of these people who took loans. You know, just like you said, you've experienced it. I've also experienced it. And at first, you know, I had this particular experience. I'm not going to mention name. And, and then I really thought that, oh, my God, so this, this lady is a fraudulent person? You know, because they sent a text message saying, Oh, X, Y, Z is a fraudulent. But do you Very know the person, person? This particular person I know. So because I had this, you know, I, you know how you have these names. You could probably have a name like, you know, two names, maybe Kunle or Ade Kunle or all of yeah. that. So you could have like three Ade Kunle's on your phone. And especially if you have not, you know, put a particular uh, different, you, you don't put any specific to a different shade. And so, so in my mind, I'm like, 
oh my God, she, she, she's fraudulent. You know, so I tried to reach out. It was later on I understood what it was about. But I'm thinking that it's a good one because it's really disturbing. First of all, I wasn't contacted. When this person's go ahead to, you know, take this loan, yes. no one told me. Now, you know the thing with having to write your, you know, your CV and all of that? You probably have to tell whoever you're going to use as your uh, referral or your reference as, okay, okay, I'm going to be using you as X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. So you don't do that without their consent. And a lot of these persons, they could, probably could be our friends. In some cases, you know this person. In most cases, you don't know them. Now, without the fact that I, I totally support it because when these people go ahead to take this loan, I am not in the know. No, no one seeks my consent. So how come I'm being disturbed at the end of the day when they're not paying? And I think that if you take some money, you should pay them. They should devise a means rather than, you know, because I feel like this is actually disturbing. It is constituting a nuisance. So oh, you is. turn off your phone and you see a lot of messages, very annoying and scary. Like to me, you know, I said it, I was really scared. And I said, oh my God, so she's, she's a fraudulent person. Well, it, it, she's doesn't, been, it, doesn't, she's, it doesn't make her and then a they fraudulent go ahead. person. No, I don't know because I saw the because text. The they're saying the that you have to report the person because yeah. she's dubious, she's fraudulent. She took oh. no, you know, so all of those descriptions. And then he started making me very scared up until I started understanding what this is about, really. So I think that is really, really wrong. Yes, it's okay to say if you put out money, uh, if you give somebody money as a loan, there should be a way to collect it. But that means of, you know, coercing, coercing people and then putting out all of those messages without the consent of the people is really disturbing and stressful. Oh, it absolutely We're going through is. a lot, you know, as a country. I mean, I used to... I say that all the time. Being a Nigerian is a lot of work. I mean, then you now live in Lagos, for instance. That's so much work already. Yeah. I mean, we don't need all of that stress. So, yes, I totally endorse this one, and I doff my hat for Akin. Yeah. Um, someone um, said, you know, every Nigerian, uh, living in Nigeria, you know, you need to be prayerful. Everybody's prayerful. Even atheists, every now and then, will say... <laughs> I don't you know, know about that um, one. <laughs> you call on God, you know, and <laughs> because of what we have to deal with. You know, but those are... You know, our top trending stories this morning. Uh, there's, of course, uh, also stories from uh, Sheikh Ahmad Gumi, who is saying that bandits, um, you know, would require land compensation uh, in order to end killings. Um, of course, it's one of the things uh, that um, was made that made the news yesterday and, of course, made, uh, you know, created a lot of conversations yesterday. Um, a lot of people mostly upset and angry, you know, that we're still hearing these type of statements from um, Sheikh Ahmed Gumi. Um, myself, you know, all, you know, inclusive, uh, because I, I've, you know, repeatedly said that Nigeria needs to take a stand and, and make it stand clear with regards to what it's, you know, it, it feels concerning banditry. Um, it cannot be treating bandits different from the way it's treating uh, ESN or treating any other group across the country. You cannot, you know, continue to hear these things from Sheikh Ahmad Gumi. Um, if he, you know, truly believes and loves Nigeria, then there should be a completely different narrative that comes from him as a, a religious scholar, um, you know, and it, it almost seems like he, you know, is, is speaking on behalf of the bandits or negotiating for bandits, you know, you know for, to the or federal government. Or spokesperson of the or bandits. Or spokesperson of the bandits, and that's really what it seems like. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what this type of requirements are, where you, whereas you hear this type of requirements, except in Nigeria, it's the only country that you hear bandits terrorists actually making this type of requirements from government saying that they need land or they need money or some some very very ridiculous and even need some, things you know at some point those uh, a particular time sometime this year i read a particular report about uh, you know, the bandits saying they would like to have a negotiation with the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I mean, I have to emphasize that. Yeah. The president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And then I started wondering, where is this gods coming from? I mean, who, how, you, how dare you dare the president to have a negotiation that we're not going to bulge until the president, they have a one-on-one -on -one and a face-to-face -face with the president. I mean, if you look at that in developed climes, how do you even expect? I felt insulted. Of course, on behalf of the president. But it goes to show that um, we constantly have laws. Let's talk about what mother is. Um, the Constitution spells it out clearly. Killing is killing. Mother is mother. And so you have this group of persons who engage in this criminal act. Uh, and, and then at the end of the day, what is the law? What does the law say about this act and activities? How come we have not had this persons arrested? 
How come, you know, we're, we're, we, we seem to have a different body language when it has to do with this sect of person? It calls for the, a lot of concern and it constantly encourages all of these uh, conspiracy theories that you have. Now, I have to, on this particular show, uh, you know, we've had to had to clarify the fact that the president does not hate, uh, you know, some part of the country because that's what it looks like. So if you treat some people, I mean, let's look at IPOP, for instance. Um, IPOP recently called off the Citadel order, and that's a terrorist group. A terrorist, don't know. if well, you look at the it's character. It's not a terrorist group. No, no, no they have been proscribed as... Um, okay, well, they've been proscribed, yeah. Of course. So you see where I'm coming from. Now, if you look at the characteristics of terrorist group over time, the Al-Qaeda's and what have you, they don't, they don't operate in this particular, uh, you know, pattern. That is not their mode of operation. So it, it calls for a lot of concern and worry, and it allows for all of the speculations and things, you know, thoughts that people would hold, saying that, you know, the body language of Mr. President, the body language of those who should be uh, responsible for ensuring that uh, this is a crime, it should be treated as a crime, that should face justice, uh, it's different. This and is then the when same bandit group that the, you know, that, that it's, the National Assembly has been begging President Mohamed Bari to declare a terrorist group. They're the ones that are seeking land. Mm. I don't know where they're going to get the land or what they're going to do. Someone said the anyway, same first. We need to go. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we're moving into our newspaper review off the press where we get a quick review of the major stories making headlines across Nigeria this morning. We'll be back. <laughs> 